Hello and welcome to this design practice 2 module 15. I would like to uh, today go into some more details about sensing or how sensors are designed or they are carried out and the first uh, important uh, significant thing that I would like to mention are about the methods of immobilization. I think I have in great details explained to you how a sensor surface is modified uh, by putting a recognition element or a layer which would be associating itself with the light of interest that you are diagnosing or sensing. And therefore, uh, a very important premise here is how do you immobilize the recognition element on the sensor surface. And particularly when we are talking about uh, a transducer surface which is able to uh, monitor chemical, biochemical, biological or gaseous entities, obviously the protocol becomes very, very complex. And uh, some ways and means are uh, established for uh, you know this immobilization uh, of the recognition element. One of them is the absorption, adsorption to a surface. Um, uh, then we have micro encapsulation, uh, which actually is trapping between members on the surface of the detector. So you have membranes. So you have two membranes, one membrane on the transducer surface and the other after the membrane has been sprinkled with the recognition element. So, it kind of entraps and these membranes hook themselves up to each other, adhere, adhere to each other or to the surface, transduction surface. So, this is called micro encapsulation. Then there is an entrapment process through which immobilization can be carried out. Uh, in the entrapment process, you can typically use a gel, uh, which is you know a semi uh, paste like semi you know uh, semi fluidic kind of a state which um, would be able to uh, give you know diffusion or which will be able to assist the diffusion process of the analyte of interest and the gel typically is a network. So, you have a series of uh, pores or sieves it is highly porous and it is also able to do some filtration as the analyte migrates towards the transduction surface or transducer surface. You can also entrap with paste or polymers onto an electrode, okay. So, that is how you can do entrapment. You can do the covalent attachment of the particular recognition element. For example, you can have uh, chemical bonds formulated between the recognition element and the transducer surface, which will give you some essence of how to immobilize. You can do cross linking, cross linking means that you have another molecule which will put in place by means of a covalent chemistry. Okay, or uh, you know because it is a bifunctional kind of a bilinker kind of a molecule. So, on one side it will link to the transducer, on another side it will have enough uh, activity to link to the recognition element. So, it kind of holds as a linker molecule the recognition element close to the transducer surface and so therefore, there are variety of these immobilization methods which one would use for the purpose of you know designing the uh, how to outlay the designing the process of outlaying the recognition element onto the transducer. Then there are several other aspects of such sensors which are of engineering consequence. One of them is about performance factors, how the sensor performs with respect to how minuscule a sample it can probably uh, take or are there any cross reactivities which may happen which may create a false signal. So, the performance factors if we look at are number one is selectivity which is the ability to distinguish between different substrates <laughs> which are there in the analyte of interest. So, substrate is basically an analyte or a type of an analyte or a type of molecule which we are detecting. So, there are multiple such molecules uh, which are there. We also have something called the sensitivity range which is uh, usually the range um, you know which uh, at which uh, detection can still happen uninterruptedly. So, therefore, <coughs> we are talking about the least amount or the least concentration of the material uh, of the analyte in the particular <coughs> solution. So, usually sub millimolar range uh, is associated, uh, but you know it can go all the way up to femtomolar range as well when we talk about such sensitivity range. That there can be a performance factor based on accuracy, how accurate the sensor can be to pick up you know analytes of trace concentrations. The accuracy better than plus minus 5 percent is always considered to be you know reasonable accuracy for a sensor to qualify. The, the nature of solution is a very critical uh, aspect when we design sensors. Um, you know sensors uh, need, uh, need to be designed for uh, the chemical reactivity, the conditions such as pH for example, the amount of abrasion that will happen 
So, the sensor needs to take care of that issue so that the transducer does not dissolve away into the solution. Uh, it also takes care of issues like what could be the temperature range at which the, the performance or the functionality does not change of the transducer or for example, what is going to be the ionic strength which is going to measure. Performance factors will also include a very important aspect which is about the response time typically for gas sensing applications or biosensors. Uh, the smaller the better, but you know, uh, you know the, the, the for the power sensing particularly this level is probably slightly high uh, with the modern technology you can say about 30 seconds or more you know of uh, sensing time is considered to be quite reasonable. Um, there is also a recovery aspect that once the sensor surface has sensed something whether it can come back to the baseline signal so that it can start sensing another analyte or another solution or another sample and for that <laughs> you need to find out how much time is elapsed before and what are the protocols that have to be carried out if any for a surface to again recondition itself which again measurements can start taking place. So, time elapsed before the sensor is ready to analyze the next sample that should not be typically more than a few minutes uh, pH sensing uh, in this particular matter is uh, you know a pretty um, commonly used uh, you know electrochemical process where we dip the electrodes in water and try to make the pH come to 7 again before the next sensing round can happen and so it has to be allowed sufficient time for whatever uh, hydrogen ions have creeped inside the glass bulb the calcogenide based glass bulb so that it can diffuse back and it can neutralize to the 7 pH ok. So, uh, some time needs uh, because of that mechanically driven diffusion process to happen completely before the next you know before the sensor is ready for the next run. So, then we also talk about working lifetime of a sensor. So, stability of the for example, the selective material is it for example, in particularly biomaterials like enzymes or antibodies which are used by some sensors. The shelf life may be as low as 3 months or 2 months. So, before that uh, it is better to be used and after that one should discard because otherwise it will start giving false signals. So, therefore, the working lifetime also forms a very critical uh, function when we talk about such performance factors related to the sensors. Let us now also look at uh, one of the reasons uh, for why we must focus on uh, making these sensors small uh, and miniaturized. Uh, we know that the rapidity and the sensitivity both these factors are really dependent on the level of the miniaturization ok that must occur. At the same time the robustness uh, factor may go, uh, go down because of the small nature physical nature of the sensors when we talk about miniaturization. And uh, generally uh, there are many reasons for doing miniaturization when we talk about sensing in the uh, chemicals or biochemical processes and one of them is reducing the sensor element to the scale of the target species. So, we must understand something that when we are detecting a small cell let us say for example, a biological cell which is about 20 microns or a bacterial cell which is about less than 10 microns and we are doing it with uh, a surface which is probably a few hundred millimeters then obviously, uh, there are issues related to how this surface would interact with such cell and there are going to be its own inertial delays because the surface is extensive in terms of the uh, sizes as compared to the target of interest. As opposed to if we were to develop a surface which would be exactly similar to the dimension of the particular species, the inertial response may not be that big of an issue in uh, the signal that the sensor provides you ok. So, Therefore, you can provide a higher sensitivity and that is outrightly the case when we talk about miniaturization. Obviously, when we talk about chemical biochemical processes reagents are very expensive uh, diagnostics particularly uh, clinical diagnostics becomes very expensive because of the size of the reagent. And if we are talking about miniaturizing the sensing element it automatically means that the reagent volumes also get miniaturized and so the associated costs of doing diagnosis by doing uh, you know designing sensors would also come down because of such reduced region volumes. Uh, there is also reduced time to uh, result due to small volumes because you can have effectively higher concentrations very small volumes small changes being sensed by a sensitive instrumentation setup. And so, any small signal which is representative statistically of the uh, you know sensing modality 
would indicate that there is an allied present or absent. Okay. So, this is a big you know advantage of miniaturization that you can actually work at those scales in much reduced time. Um, there is also amenability of portability and miniaturization of the entire system. Obviously, smaller size the better it is to carry off. There are concepts where sensors are taken to the bedside or even to the fields for doing detection um, be it agricultural sensing or be it uh, patient based medical sensing or even sensing of farm animals uh, or farm products. If you can make the sensor small it is always going to give you more you know portability more usefulness in terms of taking it to the actual spot and doing measurements quickly and rapidly. This can be used more as a screening data uh, and based on it uh, you can see whether you can take countermeasures then and there rather than waiting for sensing data to come from a sophisticated lab. So, this is also known as point of care diagnosis. Okay. So, it is a very big area of work and right now there is billions of dollars of research spent in uh, designing and developing point of care medical biomedical sensors. Uh, there is also uh, you know a scope of multi agent detection when we talk about miniaturization smaller the size the better it is you can have in a smaller space or volume many sensing elements which can sense each of these species which are there in an analyte. So, if you wanted to do multi analyte scanning and sensing uh, the best idea is to again start miniaturizing it <coughs> and then obviously, it has potential for use in vitro as well as in vivo uh, capacity and so these are some of the reasons why we must miniaturize sensors. When we talk about sizing them down and we talk about small you know overall volume within which the sensors would be occupied a major issue comes up and which uh, indicates how do you handle such fabrication or what are the kind of agents or what are the kind of techniques which are available through which you can carry out those fabrications. So, I am going to now go across <coughs> certain small um, modalities where we can talk about little about micro machining or little about uh, photo driven processes through which machining can be carried out and you can see that how uh, small sizes can be embedded or MEMS can be made with respect to um, all these processes. Uh, and typically uh, once you have an idea of how MEMS can be done then MEMS designing development sensorial design through MEMS route etcetera <coughs> becomes easier. <coughs> and for a designer uh, who is into the area of sensors design one must know these basic modalities uh, when we talk about sensor technologies. So, let us uh, talk a little bit about device fabrication. MEMS and NEMS processes typically emerged from silicon and associated silicon processes because microelectronic industries had silicon as the base material. Uh, the carbon electronics which is grown probably much later did not quite come into uh, picture when microelectronic processing was developed ab initio. And uh, therefore, MEMS has all sort of focused on to <laughs> silicon based structures, but later towards the 80s changed gears and went into the polymeric structure. So, I am going to from my perspective just give you some idea on fabrication on the silicon and some idea of fabrication of the polymer structures. So, MEMS and NEMS are typically fabricated by formation of structures that could be used to form sensors and actuators uh, at that scale micro and nano scales. Also, uh, when we talk about MEMS and NEMS, we mean that it is about the processing of electrical or non electrical signals, non electrical, for example, mass based or in thermal means, you know, which is not driven to any electron flow as such. So, then when we uh, again talk about MEMS NEMS silicon fabrication, we generally use conventional and new semiconductor manufacturing techniques. Uh, some of them may be etching, deposition, photolithography, oxidation, epitaxy and I am going to do these some of these techniques with you guys. So, you understand about how these techniques are being done. And then there are some which are actually MEM specific techniques. For example, this deep reactive ion etching can be a MEM specific technique which is used for developing high aspect ratio <coughs> structures on silicon surface or thick plating which is related to again electroplating of metals particularly uh, which can be. Uh, several microns in thickness and it can be used for purpose of fabricating MEM structures. So, when we talk about developing a miniaturized uh, superstructure for MEMS, uh, we mean uh, by developing this uh, structures which can be either bulk micro machined or surface micro machine and you know there is some 
a fundamental understanding to what is a bulk micro machining activity or what is a surface micro machining activity. For example, if we look at the schematic here to the left, uh, we see that this is a silicon wafer okay, which is uh, a thickness of the silicon wafer. This T right here is the thickness of the wafer and we are seeing material being taken off subtractively from different regions of this particular thickness of the silicon wafer. So, uh, any such process which involves subtractive machining where material is taken away uh, at the micron scale or the microscopic length scale is better known as bulk micro machining. Similarly, if on the other hand if we develop uh, features and structures on the surface rather than subtractively taking it by adding the material. For example, if we look at this particular cartoon here on the right side, uh, we are talking about films which are being uh, developed on the surface through uh, multiple techniques like deposition etc. This for example is a P double plus film okay. um, and then there are certain uh, techniques which are again further used for bringing out structures and features on the surface by adding. The bulk here is not getting sacrificed or the bulk is not getting machined. So, these are the surface micro machining. So, all additive processes are categorized as surface micro machining, all subtractive processes are categorized by bulk micro machining. If I looked at such structures and how they are formulated, this structure right here can be formulated through etching. There is a process called etching. Okay, Etching can be again uh, a high aspect ratio etching which is done using usually gas plasmas. This uh, structure here is a high aspect ratio etching. This is a low aspect ratio etching, but this can be done on a uh, wet chemical stage with wet chemistry processes. Uh, this right here, the green region is a P double plus silicon, which is uh, done by doping of the silicon structures. P double plus meaning thereby that you have uh, high, high, high amount of doping concentration of um, the uh, group 3 material, which will uh, pump in more number of holes. And uh, you know this structure right here is basically the structure which is again uh, etched out from the silicon okay? and uh, this uh, meets the green surface right about here and proceeds no further because whatever etching is being carried out stops wherever there is this P double plus layer. Okay? So, this is again a process which is called etch selectivity driven process so that you can obtain a very thin film, a small film on the surface of this particular uh, silicon wafer. Similarly, quite interesting uh, in this particular case probably there was some material which was here in this gap which has been later on sacrificially removed. The material was earlier patterned on the surface and there was a deposition of a thin film which is this hatched area right here which took place and later on this material was removed through chemical etching. So, that you have this gap created which is like a small embedded chamber which can now be used to carry fluids etcetera. Okay, so, this again uh, you know this deposited material is a sort of a polycrystalline silicon material which is higher in strength mechanical strength aspect. So, the idea is when this layer is removed here uh, it should not bend or warp okay, the structure should be stable and uh, this is through the again surface micro machining that you can build up such structure. So, that is what devices are typically uh, fabricated by and now we will start looking into some of these processes in some little details. Let us uh, talk about this particular process here which is borrowed from a microfabrication a very famous microfabrication textbook. Uh, it talks about <laughs> again using a etch stop layer and a certain you know masked certain masking process which would actually lead to the removal of this mask. The mask the you know is, is the little meaning of the English word mask meaning uh, it kind of shields. Okay. So, wherever this masking layer is present and I will I'll talk a, a great more details about what really is the masking layer and how you will be able to uh, remove the layer or make the layer uh, come up in certain selected regions. So, wherever the masking layer is present uh, whatever chemical we are going to etch or use to etch the particular material silicon here which is the white colored material here okay, it does not touch the uh, silicon if there is a masking layer. So, let us say in this region the chemical will not be able to get in touch with the, uh, the silicon which is inside and wherever there is an exposure like in this region there is no masking material. So, uh, it will start the etching process because the etchant has already contacted 
the particular surface through which there can be chemical removal or uh, subtractive machining of the particular area. So, you can carry out etching in many uh, ways, you can carry out isotropic and anisotropic etching. This is an example where anisotropic etching is carried and these etching happens because of uh, a redox nature of the chemistry which is involved and uh, ultimately it merges uh, as, a, as an array of planes okay, which uh, are corresponding to the 1 1 1 direction. Those are uh, the slowest electron releasing planes uh, because of which you know you can have this kind of a shape. But whatever it is uh, without getting into those details of chemical etching I can say that because the masking layer was present and later on you pull out the masking layer you see there is no masking layer here. So, you dissolve this layer in a suitable solvent, but till and until it was present the chemical did not affect the regions where the masking layer was shielding. Okay. So, this is a very important essence. So, you are covering something with a layer which is otherwise sacrificial layer and you are using a window created in that sacrificial layer to do selective etching. So, supposing today if you were to etch on a very small region let us say 100 micron by 100 micron uh, pit is to be created. So, you can actually pattern uh, and open up vias in the masking layer in a manner where exposure would be there to the parent material and the etching would sit on that and start etching. Okay. So, it is very interesting way of carrying out machining at a very small scale all of which can be used into what we know as MEMS okay, or what we know as microstructures which can then go into sensing and diagnostics. So, uh, this again is a structure what I described to you before there is a a layer of material which is otherwise mechanically robust, but there is a silicon uh, polysilicon layer deposited on the top of this sacrificial layer which you are removing and so uh, out props this cantilever like orientation of this particular material. So, this is how uh, you do freestanding structures okay, uh, through microfabrication technique. So, when we talk about uh, the materials which are mostly used for microfabrication, mostly the materials which come in handy are silicon and other microelectronic materials. Uh, the chips or the microchips which are being formulated would have the necessary uh, modalities of uh, being able to be transparent on the top. So, you can have covers which are made using glass or quartz which do not absorb characteristic wavelengths okay, and gives uh, free uh, gives a leeway for the detection process to happen of what is within the chip as opposed to its own component which it might otherwise give in the signal if it is a non-transparent or a slightly translucent kind of material. Uh, obviously, uh, people have realized that when we talk about clinical diagnostics and biofluid samples, they are not very well to do with uh, inorganic material like silicon because most of it would not behave in a proper manner they uh, as they do within the human body. And so, therefore, polymers are another class of material which have been found to rhyme and rhythm with that aspect and therefore, uh, people have actually uh, developed a se series of polymers which are uh, fabricable at the small scale or the micron scale. Some examples could be PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane, uh, PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate. These are the polymers which are uh, used for uh, MEMS fabrication, okay, uh, fabrication at the micron scale using resolutions and tools with uh, resolutions which are high particularly tools which would provide high resolution would be able to act on it and quickly produce an array of structures within these surfaces. I am going to get into the precise details a little bit later. Uh, uh, Teflon for example, is another such material and then there are also materials which are related to the entities themselves. For example, you can today develop devices with uh, DNA printing um, or you know where sequences of molecules are heaped together or stacked together uh, with processes like micro contact printing or dip pen lithography. So, you can actually be able to print molecules and do some uh, you know sensing diagnostics of other molecules based on the chemistry of the molecules that you have printed. So, you can make uh, assays okay, or assay technology uh, in a very rapid manner to screen off a bunch of different molecules which may be desirable or undesirable in a certain uh, you know uh, fluid example. So, I think I am going to close on this particular uh, module now because I have talked enough about the basics of fabrication. In the next uh, week's module we will start with some fundamental processes. We will also do uh, some aspects of actuators and how to design some of these sensors and actuators. As of now, thank you. Thank you very much for being with me on this. Thank you.